Thank you, Nathan. Oh, nice. So I really like compilers. Uh, they're pretty cool. One of my favorite topics. I think uh, the compilers class is being made mandatory, so I would advise you to take it, but you might have to. So, uh, But if you don't have to, I'd recommend taking it. You'll learn a lot of pretty awesome stuff, which I'm going to try and elucidate a little bit in this talk. So what are compilers? They're magic. A compiler, and they're very meta. It's a program that takes a specification of a program and produces another program, which is kind of like mind-bendy. And it's kind of weird if you think about what source code is. It's just a text file that's structured in kind of an odd way. And we as humans give certain semantics to uh, different text files. And then we have this program that turns that into things that a machine actually understands, uh, which is kind of easy to mess up, which is where compiler bugs come in. But compilers are cool. So. Uh, just a quick overview of the pipeline that happens inside of a compiler. You need to parse the text file into what's called an abstract syntax tree. And then you need to lower the abstract syntax tree into an intermediate representation. And then after the intermediate representation, you create machine code. And so if we just have this sample program, uh, for anyone, this is a really popular interview question, is how you write a store copy in a single line, and this is how you do it. Uh, but just taking this example program and showing you what the abstract syntax tree looks like. So this is just a text file, but it gets read in uh, into an AST. Um, and the reason is that trees are a lot more machine readable. Uh, it's an internal data structure a compiler can work with a lot more quickly than text. And it encodes a lot of uh, necessary details uh, really succinctly. So for that um, copying while loop, uh, this is kind of, this is what a potential abstract syntax tree looks like. And the abstract syntax tree isn't specified. Different compilers can do it slightly differently. Uh, so this is just one uh, depiction. So um, the more indented over it is, the lower it is in the tree. So the while loop has a body which had nothing in it, and it has a predicate which determines how long it keeps uh, operating. Um, it has, and the predicate is just a bin op, right? So it's equality. And on the left side of it, there is a post increment, which is the plus plus. And inside that, there's a dereference. And inside that, there's the identifier dest. And then the same thing on the right side, but with the identifier source. Um, you can imagine how a compiler could walk through this tree and do things with it. Um, so the most common thing that happens with an AST, aside from transforming it to the next representation, is you type check. Uh, so this is where you get a lot of fun errors, like you can't pass an int to something expecting you know, a char or a pointer. Um, and it also, uh, as you can see in the tree, it encodes operator precedence. So because the equality check is higher up in the tree, you know that that's going to happen. Um, and it's going to like, before the post increments happen, before the dereferences happen, uh, if you had a big arithmetic expression, all of those details of you know plus comes before multiplication, well, opposite, multiplication comes before plus, uh, all of that the compiler doesn't have to worry about once it's in the form of a tree, because trees are much less ambiguous than text. Um, but the AST is really, it's still too high level for a lot of the really useful, interesting optimizations that a compiler wants to do. Uh, so uh, you might be asking, why not go directly to machine code? And that's because machine code is machine architecture specific. And uh, a lot of my talk is going to be referencing specific parts of LLVM, uh, the, which is an acronym that doesn't stand for anything anymore. Um, but they target tons of different architectures. So instead of lowering uh, their abstract syntax tree directly to a architecture uh, language, they go to an intermediate representation, do all the optimizations on that, and then transform the last step into one of many different uh, machine architectures that they target. Yes, Nick? What is LLVM on compiler? Uh, so nothing. Uh, it's technically just the intermediate representation and backends. But one of the most common uh, front ends is the Clang front end, which is C, C++, Objective-C, and Objective-C++. But hold up. But uh, Rust also targets LLVM. Um, I think NIM targets LLVM. Like, there's many languages that can plug into the LLVM architecture. So that all they have to do is the things we've already talked about, abstract syntax tree, type checking, and that's it. And they're like good to go. You have a full language. Yes, Max? It doesn't stand for low-level virtual machine anymore? It used to, but it doesn't mean that anymore. So now it's just LLVM, because um, that name used to make sense, but doesn't anymore. Right, right. 
Um, and so the IR is, uh, they, there's some design trade-offs in this space uh, that make it a really nice middle ground between something like the abstract syntax tree and the uh, machine code that you're addressing. Um, so one difference is that uh, if you guys have taken 225 or 315, you know uh, like most of the machine architectures you work with are two address codes. Uh, which you can see on this line is things like add RDI RSI actually expands out into RDI equals RDI plus RSI, uh, which is kind of a pain. And so in an intermediate presentation, you can have a, like you can design it however you want. So LLVM uh, does it as a three address code. So you actually can do you know X equals the addition of Y and seven. Um, so three address codes are really nice. And having infinity registers is also really nice. Uh, so you know most architectures don't have unlimited registers. Uh, these are the ones in the x86 or the 64-bit extension for x86. And but in an intermediate representation, you have unlimited registers. And uh, specifically in LLVM, you can have named registers, uh, anonymous numbered registers, and then just numbers in place. Uh, so one example of that would be this function that adds three numbers would get turned into this approximately uh, LLVM representation. Uh, so you can see it takes the three parameters, a, b, and c, and they're all int 32. Um, and then it creates an anonymous result for adding a and b, and then it adds the anonymous result to c, and then returns as another anonymous result, which is percent one, and then returns percent one. So um, one interesting thing here is that in top level source code in your abstract syntax tree, you can have unlimited nesting. Uh, but in an intermediate representation, it's linear, uh, just like assembly code, just slightly nicer to work with. Uh, so here's an example for a really simple absolute value function. Um, the first line, you compare uh, n, and if n is less than or equal to 0, then you branch to the negation branch. Um, so jumping down there, all you do is negate your uh, negative integer to get a positive integer and then return it. And if you didn't branch, then you just return your positive integer. Um, and this is another departure from how typical source code works, where you have, or instead of having nested blocks, you have to explicitly have jump targets, and you have this nice linear representation, which is a lot easier for the optimization passes to work with. Uh, so some other properties besides three address code and unlimited registers, uh, you have the flat structures. All uh, control flow is reduced to branch statements. Um, so like in C, that would include switch statements. In more complex languages, it would include pattern matching. All of that stuff can all be reduced into just simple branches, uh, which also makes an intermediate representation a lot more global for the languages targeting it. Um, also, all the operations have types associated with the operation, which is also how machine code works, right? Uh, you know, racks, the first register, doesn't have a type associated with it. It just takes on whatever type the operation tells it to. And the same thing is implemented in the LLVM intermediate representation. And then we're going to come back to all the cool optimizations that happen in this stage. Uh, but then, you know, ultimately, you do have to run machine code because nothing really understands uh, LLVM IR. And some of the problems with that are that no architectures have unlimited registers, and machine codes also embed types in the operations. Um, or sorry. Uh, machine code embeds the types into the names of the operations instead of having it as an extra argument. So you know you have like move L versus move B, and there's like tons of instructions for everything. Um, and so while an intermediate representation is similar to a machine, uh, actual machine code, there are some things you have to do. Specifically, instruction generation, instruction scheduling, and register allocation. And so uh, these usually happen in this order, though the last two can be swapped or run in multiple times in different orders. Um, instruction generation is just which machine codes do I need to represent this LLVM IR opcode. So, you know, add can just usually be transformed into one or two adds depending on how many targets you use. Um, uh, instruction scheduling has to do with how you order instructions. And because modern uh, computer processors are so weird and how they like deal with data dependencies between instructions, you can actually get a lot of code performance just by rearranging instructions in a really clever way, and that's called instruction scheduling. And then register allocation is probably the most important step, which is where you map your infinity virtual registers onto the finite number of actual registers. Um, and LLVM is actually has a really awesome system in place that does all of this. Um, 
So it turns all of the virtual instructions you saw on the IR into a directed acyclic graph. And so instructions, so you know, if you have like add up here, it has two incoming nodes for its uh, inputs and one outgoing node, or one outgoing edge for where its output is. And you get this big graph representing your program. Um, and there's some really interesting properties of that graph. Like you no longer have this linear representation of how code works. You just have which operations depend on which other operations. And so then what they do is each architecture can define a bunch of patterns that match against this graph, little pieces of it, and slowly transform the entire graph from intermediate representation into um, a kind of half intermediate, half real code. It doesn't do the register allocation yet. So you have real machine instructions working on fake registers, which is kind of weird. Um, and then register allocation happens. And there's a lot of ways to do this, and they're all really weird. Um, but the things that are most important is that one physical register can support many virtual registers as long as the values in those virtual registers don't overlap. Um, and then if you run out of real registers, you have to spill onto the stack. And you have to make that decision in a smart way, because you want to spill whatever is going to uh, require the least future memory accesses. And there's a lot of really hard like algorithmic problems in this space, and even LLVM doesn't implement, like I think, the most algorithmically solid uh, approach because it would take forever to compile, and it already takes long enough to compile because of optimization passes. Uh, so compilers are interesting because they can do this transformation, but they're also interesting because, as one of my friends put it, each time you run a compiler, it's like having a team of PhDs look at your code and analyze it and make it faster. And the bulk of the time spent opti or, um, compiling um, your source code is spent in optimization passes, which is why having debug builds where you don't do that is so important. Uh, so there's two different types of passes, um, at least in LLVM and conceptually. There's analysis passes, like data flow analysis, where you try to discover facts about the intermediate representation you're working with, and then actual transformation passes that make changes. Um, so data flow analysis, each variable in your program can take on a number of values over its lifetime, and how those values flow through a function and ultimately your program is called data flow. Uh, so if we look at a function like this that just does some weird juggling of numbers, um, we can see that you, know, you start with an A, B, and C, but you quickly overwrite A with a new uh, number that depends on the old A and B, and then you do the same with B, and then later you overwrite B, but it doesn't depend on anything, but it's different from the previous Bs. Um, so one thing you can do is go through and give these better names. So you know, A, one, A sub 1 is uh, the original A plus B, and then B sub 1 is A sub 1 plus B. And you can kind of see how uh, you know, the ultimate return only depends on B sub 2 and C, which depends on different versions of A and B. Um, and then one of the places this becomes really important is when you go to do register allocation. You know that once uh, A1 has been, or A sub 1 has been assigned, nobody can use uh, the old A anymore, so you can put those in the same register. Um, but we'll get to some other uses. This is called single static uh, assignment form, SSA for short. Um, and you, so you never assign to a name more than once. Um, so as you see, in this, every time you go to assign a variable, you create a new name. Um, and then this naturally encodes data flow. You can see what depends on what. But there are some complications when you have branching in your code. Uh, so given, oops, sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, given this kind of function where you know if A is greater than B, then C is A, otherwise C is B, uh, the way you have to introduce these things called phi nodes in single static assignment form, because if you assign C sub 1 in the first branch, you're not allowed to assign C sub 2 in the second branch, because each name can only be assigned to once. So you have to create a new name, C sub 3, that is phi of C sub 1 and C sub 2. And what phi means is whichever branch I took, that's the value that C3 has. And there is a lot of difficult algorithmic analysis that goes into implementing this. Peter knows, because I struggled with it for like a month. but it's super awesome when you get it working because it allows you to do a lot of optimizations really easily. Uh, like this one that I, after spending a month implementing SSA forms, spent you know, an hour implementing both of these optimizations. Um, 
So two terms that kind of get changed into, or get used interchangeably, uh, but do have technical definitions is constant folding and constant propagation. So constant folding is when you take constant expressions and fold them into a smaller number, you just evaluate them. And then constant propagation is where you move, you substitute constants from other parts of the program into uh, your specific function. So you can see here, you know, if you have x equals seven and y equals five plus x, that becomes y equals five plus seven. Um, and then constant folding would come along and turn that into y equals 12. Uh, so you could see a function like this uh, getting reduced to the function on the right. And this is a really dumb example, but this actually happens all the time because the compiler generates code that you don't really see. Um, one of the biggest ways is through macros. There's a lot of stuff involving constants and macros, and so it's not obvious to you that dividing a macro by two is gonna be quickly reducible to a number at compile time. But once the compiler sees, or once the compiler makes those substitutions, it can do it for you. And the same thing happens when you um, inline a function, which means taking the body of some other function and putting it in place um, wherever it's gonna be used frequently in another function so that you don't have to incur function call overhead, uh, which is another fun optimization. Um, yeah, so this is an important slide because everyone has gotten into debate about whether or not you should replace all your recurrences of two times x with two bit shift one and you shouldn't, because that's dumb, unless you actually are bit shifting. Um, and so the logic behind it is that some instructions can be implemented a lot faster on a CPU than others. So for instance, the general case of multiplication is a lot slower than bit shifting. Uh, so if you have multiplication by two, if we can make that bit shifting, then it would go faster. And if you know that's inside of a loop that gets called a million times, that could really add up. Um, the compiler does this for you. The compiler knows which instructions are faster and it will reduce automatically things like multiplication by two into bit shifts and tons of other architecture specific ones as well. So if semantically your program should be multiplying by two, just let it do that. Don't make uh, micro optimizations the compiler, that the compiler can trivially figure out for you. Uh, and yes, I have gotten in arguments over this. Uh, <laughs> another cool uh, more like cutting edge optimization is called scalar evolution, which is how a variable evolves through the course of a loop running. Um, and the goal is to take some piece of code that encodes a loop and try and determine what the values of its variable are based on some linear um, for formula. It's so like a really trivial example right here is just, you know, if you have this loop that goes 10 times and adds 30 to n, you have this really simple formula you can pull out where n is 10 plus 30i. Um, but this will allow some trivial loops to be optimized out entirely. It allows like certain cases of loops to just even substitute the value that you know something has to be. Um, another really cool analysis pass that compilers do is they go through and try and prove that certain variables have to have certain values or certain ranges of values. Uh, so if you know that you have, um, so like in the absolute value example, you know that if you're in the, if you're inside the if branch, for you know, n is less than zero, that's a fact that you know about the values of that variable. Um, and when you combine facts like that into things like scalar evolution, you can just completely skip over loops in certain cases. Um, and so finally, dead code elimination. Uh, sometimes in your actual code, but usually after a lot of other optimization passes have been run on your code, you're gonna have code that either has no effect or can never be reached. Um, and so from a previous example, once you do all of your constant folding, C and D are never actually used and can just be completely removed from your program. Um, but you know, sometimes entire loops can be removed from your program or sometimes entire if statements can be removed if you can prove that a branch will never be reached, uh, which happens more often than you would think, um, especially when you include a giant library and then only use one function. If the compiler can prove that you're not gonna use 90% of that code, it just doesn't include it and drastically reduces the size of your binary, uh, which is actually really important in certain uh, fields, but not so much in some of the more common ones, I guess. Uh, and another really awesome one is called loop invariant code motion, which is a really fancy name for taking things outside of loops that you have to recalculate. Um, and the canonical example is you just have this kind of trivial for loop that you know um, i is equal to zero, i is less than the length of a string, i plus plus. Uh, this is actually O of n squared because sterlen has to be called n times, which means you're gonna be recalculating it every time you go through the loop, 
Um, so some compilers that are sufficiently clever can prove that the result of Sterlin of S will not change and hence is an invariant through the loop and then can move the code outside of the loop so it doesn't have to be um, calculated each time, uh, which would look like this from the compiler's point of view. And like, I mean, this can change an algorithm from n squared to n, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's also a, um, some pretty cool uh, machine code optimizations that happen after you go past uh, the intermediate representation. So architecture-specific strength reduction, um, a really common um, occurrence of this in the Intel world is you can change certain mathematical expressions to just be a load effective address operation, which is really fast because uh, a certain circuit in the CPU that calculates memory address offsets can do it instead of having to send it to the arithmetic logic unit. Um, there's also this optimization t technique called peephole optimization, which means just looking at three or four adjacent lines of code at a time and trying to see what you can do. Um, and the reason that's so good is that the instruction generation uh, step when you're transforming from an intermediate representation into a machine architecture representation can be really dumb sometimes and it doesn't, it can't, it has to always act assuming the worst and then the optimizer can come through and be like, oh, we can actually prove that, you know, this bad case won't happen and then transform these three or four instructions into a single instruction. Um, so yeah, there's tons of cool optimizations. Um, this is only like some of my favorite ones. There's some other ones out there as well. Um, but there's also some really cool tools that people have built using this stuff. And so it turns out that data flow information is really, really helpful. Um, and the compiler uses it uh, to tell you, you know, you're using uninitialized memory here, uh, but it only goes so far. And there's other tools that will go way farther and say that, you know, in this one specific um, branch of this if statement, you know, four if statements in, there's this one number that would make this memory uninitialized. Um, and this is actually an error I've gotten from the Kling static, static, static analyzer. Um, it'll also, you know, tell you if you're not using memory. Um, one really cool example that I think I brought up in my heartbeat or heartbleed attack was that, you know, after heartbleed came out, the problem was there was data that an attacker could influence being used to determine the length of a string um, in a trusted way. And so you can, um, one of the like data flow analysis things you can do is say, look at all the places where attackers have um, control over a variable, see all the places where that variable can be used and warn me if any of those places are bad. Um, and the, stank, or the Kling static analyzer team uh, made a pass that did just that and could detect heart bleed after it was revealed, but still. <laughs> um, and then you can prove a variable's values must be in some range statically. Um, and then mostly this operates on the abstract syntax tree um, because typically you can take an abstract syntax tree and transform it back into a working program co or source code. Yes, Max? So when you say prove a variable's value must be within some range, would a compiler ever take, like say you declare a long and then throughout your program it's entirely within like an 8-bit space? Would ever say, oh, you're using 8 bits, so we're going to give you a char instead or something like that? Oh. Uh, just straight up allocate less memory? Possibly. It would really depend on the language. Uh, with C, I don't think it can because there are certain promises it makes about your memory layout. And so if you ask for a long, you know, long, if you ask for a long, it's guaranteed to be, you know, larger than an in. But um, so C, a, a C compiler wouldn't, but another language that didn't make that guarantee absolutely could. Um, and there's a lot of really cool tools. There's one I heard about inside of Google um, that they only talk about in like this one obscure conference video, but they would run this tool across all their code base that would um, parse into an abstract syntax tree using Clang, all of their C++ code, automatically change code to use new versions of APIs, and then transform that back into working source code, um, and then recommit that to their tree. And then just run this as a giant MapReduce job across all of their source code that's ever written at Google, which is super badass, um, and totally the kind of thing I want to do. So, some specific tools, like I've been saying, the Clang Static Analyzer is really awesome and pretty easy to use. Um, Clang also has um, things called memory and thread sanitizers that will inject extra code into your binary that make it run way slower, but they do a lot of runtime checks to make sure that you're accessing memory correctly, that threads aren't stepping on each other's toes. Um, things that you can't prove statically, at least in languages like C, 
and helps you detect some of those really hard to uh, access errors. Um, also, if you guys use like an IDE with semantic autocompletion, where you can say, you know, um, complete, you know, you can start typing and like tab out to complete something. Usually, it's um, something built in the compiler that is generating that list of completions. Um, and then there's also automatic obfusc obfuscation, which is kind of an anti-optimization. And one of my coworkers this summer had written a bunch of optimization passes to LLVM that would just do weird shit to his program uh, to make it much harder to reverse engineer. Um, and one of my favorite examples is there are lots of different ways to call functions. Um, and as long as the caller and callee agree, you know, everything works out. And so his compiler pass would choose a randomly one of the different calling conventions for every single function and just make sure it matched up. So if you got used to looking at code to all the assembly in one way and expected it to push arguments here or like pull them off the stack here, you just get completely confused. Um, and so a lot of fun tools out there like that as well. Anyway, uh, and that's what I have for you guys. So if you have any questions. OK, thanks. Yes, Nick. So obviously you talked, you talked about in your uh, presentation about what you um, should do for optimizations. What, if any, role should I as a programmer play in doing optimization versus allowing my compiler to right. You should do algorithmic optimizations. So you know, it's like your compiler, at least com today's compilers, are never going to upgrade insertion sort into merge sort or quick sort, right? Like those are the kinds of changes you have to do. Okay. Um, but if you find yourself doing things like, you know, I'm going to copy and paste this little function over here so the function call overhead isn't incurred, like don't do that. The compiler can do the small stuff for you. A lot of the like really simple transformations are the things compilers are really great at. Um, and usually have better intuition than you will about whether or not that optimization is actually worth it. Oh, another thing I should mention about optimization, a lot of people assume that you can only optimize for speed, and that's definitely not the case. You can optimize for memory usage, and especially nowadays, um, device energy usage is a huge thing. And you know, so it's like your code is you know 10% slower, but you know your phone's gonna last twice as long because of the uh, energy usage. That might be totally worth to optimize. Um, yeah. Yes. I know with like GCC, there are tons of different uh, levels you can mm -hmm. choose your optimization to go. Is there ever, um, so you just mentioned optimizing for speed or memory or mm -hmm. other things. Uh, maybe that's one of the trade offs, but like, what are some of the trade offs in the different uh, levels? Uh, yeah, so you'll sometimes hear people say, you know, don't compile your code with dash 03. Um, this really gets to me because there's a lot of things you're not allowed to do in C, like accessing a null pointer or accessing invalid memory. You know, this is undefined behavior. Um, and the reason that's undefined is because the compiler can assume that you'll never do it and then not have to check certain things. Or, you know, if you do access a pointer in somewhere in C, the compiler gets to assume from that point forward that, that pointer was not null, and then it can take away any future null checks in that same function um, and that kind of thing. And so if you write invalid C code, then dash 03 can create invalid binaries because it's optimizing based on assumptions that you weren't you know, upholding. And by assumptions you're on upholding, I mean the language standard. Um, <laughs> so that's one trade-off. Uh, and it's actually funny, you know, like Vim doesn't compile with dash 03 uh, because it does depend on undefined behavior. And so you can only compile with dash 02. Um, but a huge trade-off, really, <laughs> I know. Um, really old code, though, from that doesn't help. Like, ah, it kind of helps. Like, the point is that Vim the is crusty, is like really crusty. Right, um, yeah, like thank Peter. Is the standard, and Vim was definitely like pre-1989. Okay. A lot of it still is. Makes sense. Uh, when invalid, invalid memory accesses were totally legit. <laughs> um, and uh, another big trade-off is that as you add optimization passes and as you crank them up, um, to do more and more analysis, that's going to take longer and longer and longer. And you know, it's kind of one of those exponentially increasing things because you have to, um, like, you have to consider larger and larger cases to get your next linear win. Um, so you know, dash 03 can take way longer, especially on large code bases, to compile than dash 02 or 01 or even 00. Um, I would really recommend that. Um, so that's another big trade-off: is that it just takes way longer to compile. to compile uh, code you're debugging without optimization. 
by the production at the end. Yes, I always test the one that you uh, finish and we're about to roll out the production. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Got a question?